Okay. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Florian, here working for MEDAL, and it's my pleasure to moderate the today's Expats online meeting. So our topic is 10 things I wish I had known as a new CI surgeon. So I can't 100% promise that it will be really sharply 10 things. So let's be a bit more generic. So before we get started, I, I want just to share some tips with, with you. So we would like to encourage you just to enter your, your name, your organization, country, from where you are joining us. And to avoid background noise, I would highly recommend to keep your microphone muted. So by default, it's, it's off. Uh, to ensure a stable internet connection, it would make sense to close all other programs, although that it's not always the case. And if you have questions, so I would like to ask you to enter them into the chat or raise your hand if you want to um, just ask them directly. Uh, however, I would just like to mention that we also have a Q&A section at the end of our session today. Okay, right. So let's go on. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. So we have Professor Gunesh, Gunesh Rajan, who is the co-chief of the ENT clinic in the Kantonspital Luzern and who also has a strong affiliation to Australia. So he is a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Western Australia in Perth. And we have Professor Kevin Brown here with us today, who was recently appointed professor of otolaryngology. He's the chief of division of otology and uh, <clears throat> neurotology, skull-based surgery, and the medical director of the Children's Cochlear Implant Center at the University of North Carolina. So to also give us the opportunity uh, to learn more about our participants today, we would like to ask you just to complete uh, the, the, the little questionnaire we prepared for you. <clears throat> So just indicate your experience level with CI surgery. So maybe that's not appropriate at all. So, or you just uh, just briefly indicate the number of implants you already provided. So that already looks very interesting. So we have quite a few people who are who don't have a surgical background, but some apparently also do CIs, which is very nice for us to see. <laughs> We just give it a little bit more time just to give everyone the opportunity just to enter his or her personal experience level. All right. Okay, I think that's it. So the majority has no surgical background, but some people already have done a significant number of implants, so more than 100 devices. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to uh, our agenda. So uh, we would now to continue with our five piece. I know it's not 10 points, but at least it should be mentioned before we go on. So proper preparation prevents poor performance. I think that's key. As I think Professor Rajan pointed out, so um, this for sure covers patient selection, the team which backs up a CI program, equipment, surgical mentoring, key surgical aspects. I think our speakers today could easily talk half a day about these topics. Nevertheless, we tried to keep it brief and, and condensed. Yeah. Then we, uh, uh, Professor Brown will share a video about uh, basic surgical steps. And then uh, Professor Rajan will give us more insights on structure preservation surgical techniques. Okay, so <clears throat> Professor uh, Rajan, how, how do you find the right candidates when we talk about the five Ps, so to say? How do you identify those right candidates? <clears throat> Well, that's a quite a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry for that. Nonetheless, it's uh, it's key for for you know identifying and be having a successful hearing hearing implant program. I guess finding the right candidates is the result of having various important elements 
in, in our program. So I think obviously, you know, you can look at the audiological criteria, which, you know, are more or less quite well defined, you know, the different types of hearing loss, be it a low corner audiogram, be it, you know, partial deafness, or be it unilateral, you know, single-sided deafness. So the, these conditions are quite well, well uh, defined, and uh, they're quite good criteria and consensus on, you know, how to, um, to find these candidates. So they are certainly you know, very important. So these consensus and guidelines to, to identify the right patients and, and candidate and subsequent candidates, you know, for a, for a cochlear implant. But I, get, I guess the, the key is to implement these guidelines and candidates, you really need a comprehensive, you know, implant unit, which, which allows you to do all the audiological testing required, you know, to identify these patients, and uh, and also have the appropriate setup, you know, you know, obviously, uh, from the surgical point of view, we'll talk about that later, we, and also, of course, and key, you know, have the appropriate people and set up for the rehab, the whole rehab program. Okay, so that, that already brings me to, to my next question. So the key uh, elements of, of a SEI program, you already mentioned the team. I'm on, I don't know, Professor Brown, can you just share more details about that? How's that uh, handled in your, in your center? Sure. Um, one of the things that I would also like to add on to uh, what Ganesh was talking about is that, um, you know, I think sort of the geography of the setting that you are practicing in is really important. Um, here in North Carolina, as is the case with many of the states, um, there is a significant rural population that we work with, um, people that are coming from, you know, relatively underserved areas um, and away from really the central economic bases. And being able to get out into those communities, um, particularly into the practices of other laryngologists that aren't performing cochlear implants and being able to educate them on contemporary criteria for cochlear implantation, as well as you know, the benefits that this population of patients uh, can experience, I think is wildly helpful for the success and growth of your program, both from the perspective of creating a situation where um, you're going to get more of those cochlear implant referrals because there's buy-in from those other places. And also um, it will improve the success of your program because you will become identified by those providers as being a go-to person to send complicated ear cases to. Um, so I think um, that's really a critical, important, critically important component of not only identifying you know, those patients out in the community that need your services, but also creating a circumstance where you're ensuring the, the success of the growth of your cochlear implant program. Um, as far as you know, the elements of a cochlear implant program that I think are really critical, you know, obviously it starts with the patients, but you also have to have personnel that are competent, experienced, and really quite motivated to help these patients, because sometimes this can be, you know, relatively difficult discussions to have with, with people, and uh, having really good frontline audiologists that um, can uh, take care of a lot of the education and um, sort of the discussion about, you know, success, considerations, all that, um, before they even see the surgeon, I think is really critically important. And then um, within the program, having um, a structure that enables um, interaction between surgeons, whether it's in a circumstance of mentorship or whether it's you know, just a, a collegial relationship with the people that uh, you're working with, where you can discuss, you know, in particular, more complicated cochlear implant cases. I think that really, really facilitates a successful program. And we, we do that routinely where we talk about some of our more complicated cases um, before and after those cases are done. And then as Ganesh alluded to, I think really having a, a, a rehabilitation program, both from the perspective of the audiologist that is, you know, adjusting the mapping 
over time and the programming to ensure the, the, the patient success as well as the oral rehabilitation component, which we probably don't do as well here in the States as uh, it, in adults in particular, as is done over in Europe, but can still be, you know, uh, uh, a component that can be really helpful for those folks. And I think the final thing, which is something both Ganesh and I believe very passionately about is that integrating research into your cochlear implant program really helps you to stay abreast of the latest developments and actually be involved in those latest developments that help us be able to, to provide a better service to patients. Okay, great, thanks. Um, from my humble engineering viewpoint, uh, equipment and tools seems to be also relevant. Can you just say a few words about that? Maybe Professor Rajan can just give us some, yeah. some brief insights. I know it's also a big topic for sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add to what Kevin said, you know, the key elements, you said the team. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that every uh, truly successful hearing implant program is, 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 is on the shoulders of a really multidisciplinary team. You know, you have the surgeons, you have the audiologists, you have the speech pathologists, you need psychologists, you know. So uh, basically who then also formed this, you know, we, for example, you know, here in Switzerland, also in Australia, we had this a, a multidisciplinary team that discussed the patient like uh, Kevin alluded to. And it's all the input and the knowledge of every, every specialty came in to find the right hearing rehabilitation solution for the for the patient, right? And I think another important component, if I may add that, is especially if you have, you have a pediatric cochlear implant program is a very good you know, liaison with the neonatal hearing screening program. I think that's absolutely crucial for the early detection and intervention. So that it only starts there. You know, that's basically, that should be also factored in that that is, you know, an element, um, an important element in, in, a, in a comprehensive cochlear implant program. And uh, coming to the setup, uh, I guess, you know, the, it needs some basic equipment, you know, as you said, you know, it needs the appropriate surgical equipment, uh, which is uh, available in, in, in a lot of hospitals nowadays. I mean, you, you need the usual otologic gear you know, um, you want to make the, sa the surgery as safe as possible. You know, usually all our implant cases, are, you know, are done under facial nerve monitoring, things like that. And obviously, you need the appropriate uh, radiologic facilities as well. You know, you need a you know, good level, good quality CT and MRI. Again, especially if you're doing pediatric patients, you know, with, with potentially malformations, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, you know, because this is, you know, this, this session is about, you know, novice surgeons getting into, you know, is getting into cochlear implants. Uh, uh, appropriate training of the surgeon is important. And I guess there, you know, there's obviously there's different ways where you can come into, you know, into cochlear implant surgery. But they're also, you know, it needs that that experienced uh, working in 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 high volume centers, getting the exposure, so that you are confident to also, you know, deal with uh, complicated cases. And it's good to have maybe also a mentoring system, you know, where you, you have a network of experienced CI surgeons who you can get in touch with and discuss, you know, complex cases and, and, and uh, make use of their experience. So I think the, the mentoring program or fellowship program is a little bit different in the United States, right, Professor Brown? Yeah, I think there's um, generally a more formalized approach to um, the uh, otologic and neuro-otologic training. Um, you know, one of the, there's basically two pathways that I think people and follow to get advanced training in doing cochlear implantation. Um, and one of those pathways is through a pediatric otolaryngology fellowship. Um, obviously that would need to be in a reasonably high volume center for them to be able to get the experience to, to consistently and safely 
uh, and frankly, quickly perform uh, surgery in these younger patients. Um, and uh, the other would be a neurotology fellowship, um, which is going to be experienced in all aspects of adult and pediatric ear surgery, including skull base surgery. Um, and uh, that ends up being a two-year fellowship. The Pete's fellowship is typically a one-year fellowship. Um, we do have people that come from, as Ganesh had mentioned, high volume centers. We've had patients from our center that does about 300 a year uh, that have uh, gone out into the community and are doing cochlear implants without that additional training. And I think that is certainly acceptable and appropriate. Um, but it does require kind of that high volume experience, either in a fellowship or in your primary residency to really be in a position to do this. Yeah, I guess I can add to that. The, the high volume and also uh, is, is important. And also, uh, you know, some basic experience in lateral skull based surgery, which obviously in the US is well organized through the neurotology fellowships, which is very comprehensive. But I think it, it's good uh, for you know CI surgeon also to you know uh, know these basic skull based techniques because you know you can face for example lateralized sigmoid sinus that obliterates the mastoid you know and then you need to deal with that and there again you know the skull based techniques are very useful so I think it's always good to have a skill set that you know is beyond the the routine you usually do because that makes you cope with, you know, unusual or special kind of scenarios. That's certainly helpful. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So uh, now my next question I would just like to bring up is uh, electrode selection. So how do you find the right electrodes for your candidates in your center? <clears throat> so I'm happy to, to, you know, jump in. I think, you know, in cases in which uh, structure and hearing preservation are really paramount for us. I think as a institution, we do tend towards doing uh, lateral wall electrodes um, for patients that are older. Um, we have been noticing a trend now for I think a number of years that uh, cognitively, it seems like it is easier for patients to adjust to uh, the information that the longest electrodes are providing. Again, that's anecdotal, but it just seems to be the case that if we put shorter electrodes in, that those patients can sometimes struggle with adjusting to the information the implant provides. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there are patients that come in with specific preferences on devices, and, you know, depending on the degree of hearing, we'll choose either uh, deeper electrodes or shorter electrodes. Um, and we are starting to incorporate OtoPlan that uh, recently got approved here in the United States to uh, assist us in selecting electrode lengths. Yeah, it's, I agree. The you know same trend. We have been we had, we were lucky to have the you know the capability of using the OtoPlan for a few years now, and uh, it, it's really helped because we realized that you know there's a huge variability in, in cochlear duct length and cochlear size. And, uh, you know, there's obviously emerging res you know, research and data showing that, you know, the insertion depth with the same electrode length can vary in, in various patients. So because of the, this cochlear size, so I think in, in future, uh, it'll be very important to, in order to try to tailor the electrode size to the cochlear size that we, we measure the, you know, the, um, uh, the cochlear. And, and now with AutoPlan being available, I think it's, it's a really useful tool to, to be able to do that. And then also obviously consider the, the type of hearing loss the patient has. And especially, you know, if, if they still have some residual hearing whether it's a stable situation, is it a partial deafness situation, or is it a progressive hearing loss? So these are all elements you, you factor in into the decision making, you know, which electrode uh, you obviously choose. Okay, yeah, very interesting indeed. So customized electrodes would be probably a big challenge for, for uh, a manufacturer's logistic. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, 
just another thing what's coming up more and more is also, especially in the pediatric population is genetics and of the hearing loss. So uh, that also probably in, you know, play an increasing role as we know more and more about the, the different types of genetic induced hearing loss and their natural evolution and progression. That will also help us to decide, you know, the, with regard to the electrode selection. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so be, before we now tap into the, the basic surgical steps, I would just like to ask you if you just, if you just could up, come up, sorry, with, a, with one key surgical aspect uh, which you uh, would have, which would have been helpful to know when you started your career as an autologist back then. Um, I'm happy to start on this. Um, I can, for cochlear implantation, I think the key thing that I sort of discovered is I went through, you know, the first three to five years of my career and everything is how important the facial nerve is. Um, and what I mean, obviously, you know, the facial nerve is important for facial motion, but how important identifying and skeletonizing the facial nerve is to doing uh, successful cochlear implantation, particularly if you are uh, doing round window uh, insertions, because really the, the key to optimizing your approach as well as your angle of insertion is maximal exposure of the round window. And sometimes the round window can be more posterior relative to the facial nerve. Sometimes it's easy and it's anterior and well exposed. But if it's in a more posterior location, you really have to skeletonize the anterior border of the facial nerve as well as removing the retrofacial uh, bone behind that to, to really get that good angle that's going to number one, enable you to do a successful round window insertion, and number two, uh, to optimize your ability to preserve structure and hearing. Yeah, well, say, I mean, I totally agree the, you know, because with the, uh, with the real re-emergence of the round window insertion, you know, the exposure to the round window is key, as Kevin nicely explained. And interestingly, I found, you know, doing round window vibrant sound bridge surgery really helped me to get the exposure right, because you had to really make sure you, you fit the FMT, into, you're able to fit the FMT into that round window niche and, and it sort of taught you how to drill out the, you know, the round window, the niche, the anterior lip, the superior lip, these aspects. And obviously, as Kevin said, you know, the facial nerve is your friend. So make use of him or her and, uh, and deal with that. The other thing is I also learned is take, you know, don't rush, <laughs> especially with the insertion. As a fellow, I was really happy, you know, when I had found the round window and then all I wanted is to, you know, introduce the electrode as quickly as possible. And <laughs> over the years, you know, I've learned and obviously also research has shown that it's probably, it pays off to, to do it nice in a nice and relaxed uh, fashion. Yeah. Yeah, so slow insertion is key. Yeah, yeah. For, also for structure preservation, which we will learn then later. Okay, so now I would hand over to uh, Professor Brown again, who will now share uh, a brief video and I think some slides about, again, the basic surgical steps. <laughs> All right, uh, you're seeing my screen okay? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of the surgical techniques for cochlear implantation that um, I've sort of learned over the years to be uh, helpful and important. Um, and really, um, I have kind of focused this into these uh, four tips. Uh, number one um, is I think that it is critically important to thin the posterior canal wall. And when I'm teaching this to trainees, um, basically what I am telling them is that there is a plane that one can uh, see developed by the lateral semicircular canal. Um, and the plane of the posterior canal, if you want to optimize your exposure, needs to be 
anterior to that. And there really aren't a lot of circumstances that I've ever encountered where you're not able to do that. Um, and when you create that plane um, in front of the uh, lateral submuscular circular canal, then that really creates optimal exposure of your facial nerve. Um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, find the nerve. Um, and again, one of the things that I tell my trainees is that it's really difficult to hurt something if you find it. So when you're operating, if you're in fear of either getting too close to the facial barb, the sigmoid or the tegmen, any of those things, then inevitably you will um, because you don't see them. You don't know where they're at. If you find it, you know precisely where it's at. So um, I coach all of our trainees to identify the facial nerve as it comes past the lateral semicircular canal and then to trace it all the way down to the uh, insertion of the corda tympani. And uh, skeletonizing the anterior border and removal of the retrofacial bone really optimizes your exposure of the round window niche. Um, I modify the round window niche from the shape of a cylinder to a truncated cone, and I'll show you what that means in just a second. And as Gunesh uh, mentioned, go slow. Um, when you're putting these long lateral wall electrodes in, Medell has made these to be very soft, very flexible. Um, and what that means is that if you're inserting these electrodes and you're doing so very slowly, then you're giving an opportunity for that tip of the electrode to gently pass all these structures and find its way all the way into the apex. Um, sometimes with a really long electrode, people struggle and inevitably they're struggling because they're trying to push them in too quickly. Um, so I think those are all, all important tips. Um, so just to show demonstration, when I say thin the posterior canal wall, um, can you guys see my cursor as I'm moving it? Yes. Um, this is the posterior canal wall here. This is the plane of the lateral canal here. And you can see how far anterior um, that plane is um, relative to the plane of the lateral canal and how that really optimized my ability to see the facial nerve. Uh, skeletonizing the facial nerve, removing the retrofacial bone. You can see that's been done in this particular case. And you're getting a really nice early exposure of the round window. And then this is what I mean by modifying the round window niche from a cylinder to a truncated cone. So with all of the bone that Ganesh had mentioned that normally surrounds the round window, it's almost more like a cone. And if you try to insert an electrode in a cone, then it's going to follow the configuration of that cone into the cochlea meaning that you don't have sort of the flexibility of that angle of orientation to direct the electrode in that anterior inferior direction that we know is going to put it in the scale of tympani uh, uh, optimally. Um, and if you remove these edges, then really what that does is kind of give you back that flexibility to be able to insert this with the minimum uh, in the proper orientation with the uh, minimal degree of trauma. And then slow insertion. Um, I do 30 to 60 seconds typically. And what I'm imagining in my mind as I'm doing this is the electrode is really floating its way up the cochlea. Um, so keeping your paralymph, don't suction on the round window, all those things that we know not to do, um, and then float that electrode up the cochlea. And then I'm going to jump to a quick video that demonstrates this. I'll stop my share here briefly and then bring up the video. All right, so I'm just gonna jump through this a little bit. Um, so here we see just uh, exposure of the mastoid, um, drilling the, um, uh, the uh, channel for the electrode to sit in, and then we'll just jump forward. Here, the mastoids um, starting to become better exposed and we're showing you know, the exposure of the tegmen, opening up the sinodural angle so we get optimal sort of visualization of the uh, antrum and then subsequently our incus, opening the zygomatic root. Oops, let me take a step back. And just again, here is where we're showing that really aggressive sort of thinning of the posterior canal wall to really 
push the plane of that posterior canal wall in front of the lateral semicircular canal. Facial nerve is now skeletonized and now removing that bone that is medial to the facial nerve and below uh, the uh, stapes. Sometimes you do have to remove a little bit of the pyramidal process and sometimes you will encounter the uh, stapedius muscle and or tendon. Um, and I find that okay um, to, if you have to remove some of that to get the exposure that you want. And then optimizing round window exposure. In this case, again, taking those ledges that were discussed and really changing this from like a, a cylinder into more of a truncated cone. And then slow insertion. Which I will, uh, I'm sure Ganesh is gonna talk about and I'll back off. Um, so I think those are really some of the critical tips, elements that I think really ensure successful cochlear implantation uh, being done. And um, surgically, I think if you're able to accomplish these things, you're going to have a lot of very successful outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, slow insertion is a good introduction for uh, the presentation of Professor Rajan. Can you see my screen all right? Yes. Great. All right. Yeah, I just want to briefly talk about a bit the evolution of what, you know, uh, Kevin just demonstrated. The basic steps, you know, as you beautifully demonstrated, you know, are the, this, you know, the, the elements for, to progress onto what we call structural preservation surgery nowadays. So, um, and this is this has sort of changed cochlear implantation implantation over the last you know probably fifteen years, and um, I'm, I'll just introduce you in, to this topic, and I'd also like to acknowledge the the team that sort of was responsible you know in, in doing all these experiments and you know and and trials. So uh, great team I have in in Australia and Perth. So. Why are we talking about structure preservation? I think you've probably heard that, you know, the years, the, the, the aim of cochlear implantation has sort of evolved. Initially, it was all about hearing restoration. You know, we could make, make you know, people with profound sensor in your hearing loss or deaf people with no hearing at all, we could make them hear again. And then over the years, you know, in the, in the, in the late 80s, suddenly, you know, colleagues came up with the possibility of actually implanting and actually preserving the ear in the implanted ear. And that gave a lot of benefits from the audiologic point of view in various dimensions, be it sound localization, be it music appreciation, be it speech and noise perception. So the combination of residual hearing and the implant in the same year was a very strong combination, which has sort of exponential benefits for the patient. So in order to improve that capability of preserving that residual hearing, you know, over the years now, the last 10, 15 years, the, the techniques, techniques evolved. And we realized, you know, it's, it's not only about hearing because the inner ear is not only, you know, the, the hair cells, in the cochlear system, but it's also the whole vestibular system. So, which led to the, this, this concept of structure preservation of the inner ear when we do cochlear implantation as a paradigm. So, I just want to briefly take you through what, what it means. How do we achieve that? When we started, we didn't really know where we were going because we didn't really understand the different elements that played into this and how we could you know, change them or uh, what we had to look out for. And as we studied this, you know, various groups, we learned more and more. And I would like to share that with you. I think it's very important, you know, if you take away this into your practice that you realize this sort of this two hit concept of inner ear injury 
in cochlear implantation. Uh, you know, one is the trauma we induce during the CI surgery itself. And, you know, and that's related to the mechanics, the forces we apply, the drilling we do, you know, all these elements are a trauma to the inner ear. The second is what happens. The second hit is what happens once the array is in the cochlea. It, it can induce a whole lot of processes, which again can lead to further damage or injury of the inner ear. So how can we tackle these two hits? And there it's important to understand that there are obviously patient factors, you know, uh, which have an influence. So as we discussed before, it's the anatomy, it's the age. We know that, you know, we can preserve residual hearing better in the, in the children than in adults. And then obviously it's an important factor is also the, the amount of residual hearing left. So the elements, how we can influence and that's what we have learned over the last decade is that we can try and protect the inner ear from this traumatic events. We can optimize our surgical techniques by paying attention to the insertion mechanics when we insert the electrode. And obviously there's also elements with regard to the actual design of the array as well, which have an impact. And I'll talk about that briefly. And obviously, the now and the future will allow us to actually monitor the hearing uh, even better during the actual surgery. So this is a brief checklist, basically an expansion of what Kevin showed. These are the various elements you know uh, we use, and I, I'll just briefly go through that. If you want to have more details about that, please feel free to to contact me or email me. So how do we tackle the first hit during surgery? So there we have to understand insertion mechanics. It's very simple. Very simple is that when we do cochlear implantation, we introduce a, the array, which has a certain volume. We introduce this volume, this mass into a confined fluid filled space of the cochlea. So it's, it's basic physics, hydrodynamics, that if you tr introduce that, you automatically increase the pressure in the cochlea. And if you understand that, you understand a lot of the rationale of all these techniques, because they aim at reducing the intracochlear pressure changes in the cochlea. Why? Because these changes we know are not good for the hair cells, the, the inner ear structures, the basal membrane, the neural elements. So, so that's why the understanding of this concept of the intracochlear pressure and the insertion mechanics is very important. That's the most important thing we have to take along really from the structure preservation point of view. So it only starts by the way you open the round window. You know, there's different ways how you can open the round windows. You know, uh, that you can use a needle, you can, some people use a laser, you can use the sickle knife, whatever. No matter what you use, as shown in this diagram by Mittman and colleagues, you can see you always induce quite significant pressure changes. And these pressure changes basically equate, you know, they like, they, they range up to 90, 900 dB equivalent. So you induce quite a large, so acoustic trauma, so to speak, when you open the round window. So how can you overcome that? You do, you open the round window underwater, be it steroids, be it saline. And this is beautifully shown by Todd and colleagues. So if you open the round window underwater on your right hand side, you see you basically attenuate all the pressure changes through the opening mechanism. So that's, one take home message, open the round window underwater. Then, you know, nowadays you're probably familiarized. I'm really happy that, and a lot of our colleagues who are, you know, who pra practice hearing preservation surgery over, over the last few decades, or the, over the last decade, you know, uh, are happy about the awareness that the insertion speed is crucial because if you put in the electrode array too quickly, you, crawl, you create basically a tsunami inside the cochlea because the pressure changes 
are so high and they'll be, you know, they'll be damaging. So if you insert the array really slowly, you attenuate these pressure changes. And the slower you can put it in, the better. And this is just a study from uh, Georgos Kontorinis and also our studies a few years ago showed how by reducing the speed, you can improve or reduce, minimize the pressure changes. And the second spin-off effect of a slow insertion is also a much higher rate of complete insertions. So that goes hand in hand. And this is also to show you a surgeons, even though no matter how good uh, expert CI surgeons we are, we are, we are always limited because by our hands. And this is just to show you a beautiful study by my master's student showing the variations of pressure during insertion. You have the blue line, the orange line, and then if you do it freehand, and the moment you actually fixate your hand, you can attenuate those pressure changes also during manual insertion. So that's a little trick as well. So put your hand somewhere, rest your hands somewhere while you're inserting it, the array. We talked about the array design. This is just to show you what, what an impact it plays. You know, you have, as, as you introduce the electric, you can see the force on the y-axis increase. And this is an example of a perimodal. On the top left is a perimodal array. And you can see how quickly the pressure increases. And the other three are lateral wall arrays. And you can see how, what the difference is between a perimodal array and the lateral wall array when it comes to introducing and causing intracochlear pressure changes. Don't think you're finished with the implantation after you inserted the array. Why? Because you can cause significant damage inside the cochlea potentially after the introduction. How? By as you position the receiver, you know, the, the lead to the receiver call in the mastoid, you can cause again, you can cause significant pressure changes inside the cochlea. Again, studies, these great studies for Mittman and his and the group showed that. How can you neutralize those pressures? Very easy. You actually fixate the lead in one point, let's say in the posterior tympanotomy, while you put in the receiver coil and the, or the, the lead of the receiver coil, I mean. So that's an easy trick, but you can see on the, on the left hand side, you can see what happens if you just let, don't fix the, the lead and see the attenuation of the pressure change on your right hand side. If you fix the lead, let's say for example, in the posterior tympanotomy. Another important component um, is, and I want to be brief here, you can also protect the inner ear pharmacologically. And pharmacologically, you can actually have a positive effect on both hits. During the actual first hit, during the surgery, and especially on the second hit during those uh, you know, uh, attenuating those inflammatory processes after cochlear implantation. And um, I just want to show you the impact. Steroids are probably the easiest hair cell protectors we have. Steroids, but not only protect hair cells, as shown here, they also protect the spiral ganglion cells. So the, hair, the steroids protect hair cells, but also the neural elements in the cochlea, which are important. And this is a study we, again, a few years ago, where we were able to show what happens if you introduce steroids and it can, and it can really improve. If you look at the patients with the left corner audiogram, it, you can actually preserve the hearing much better with the use of steroids. How can we further improve the surgical technique? And as I mentioned before, you can probably improve the, the hearing monitoring, and we have various systems available now then. I really invite you to reuse them regularly so that you can familiarize with yourself with them and use them so that it's really normal for you to, to actually do the hearing monitoring during CI surgery. And this is just an example of a patient, you know, where we did the intracochlear hearing monitoring up to the the insertion of 28 millimeters and you have this nice cochlear microphonics 
And you can see pre and post-op, the nice hearing preservation, which correlated with the intraoperative hearing measure. So again, to summarize, the take home message is keep the two hit theory in mind of in ear injury during CI. The first hit that's through because of us surgeons when we do the surgery. The second hit is of what happens when the implants in the inner ear. How do we tackle that? The first hit, remember, think you always run window when you open it. Think about how you can reduce the pressure by inserting the array underwater. You can also keep in mind that the pressure also change can be attenuated through a slow insertion while inserting the electrode. And don't forget, the pressure changes can also occur after insertion. So when you put the lead into the mastoid, fix the electrode distally in the posterior tympanotomy of the, the distal lead end to avoid the pressure changes. Again, how to open the membrane, we talked about that underwater, make a big opening so that the perilymph can ingress to neutralize the pressure changes. And then do a slow insertion, ideally, you know, three minutes, if you can, and consider the inner ear protection with steroids, because steroids have an effect on the first hit as well as on the second hit. So I think that's where I want to conclude and open the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um... Now, before uh, we are ready for our question and answer section, we just would like to take a brief moment and just to take a group photo. So please just, if you want to uh, enable your, your screen, uh, your camera on top of your screen, and then just share your picture with us. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, just take my cup. Cheese. Cheese. Give us a smile. Are we done? Okay, thanks for that. All right. Okay. So we just grab the photo. Oh, I'm not looking at the camera. Well, <laughs> So now, um, are there any questions from the audience? So we have now our experts here. So our colleague Anand just uh, wrote in the chat. Uh, so he's curious to learn the patients who were implanted 20 years ago, are they now currently re-implanted with a new device? And if so, how well the soft surgical technique can be successfully applied in the re-implantation surgeries. So Professor Brown, Professor Rajan, yeah, do you have I'm, experience? I'm happy to take that question. Um, and uh, maybe not quite 20 years, but certainly patients that were implanted mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15 years ago that were implanted with hearing preservation um, that was successful. We've actually published a series, um, a short series, and Subsequently, we're in the process of publishing a larger series where we have removed their prior implants and uh, placed new implants and been able to retain their hearing afterwards, uh, be able to retain functional hearing. So I think all of the techniques that you know uh, Ganesh and I talked about um, are uh, ones that should certainly still be applied in the setting of revision surgery because you still want to be able to to retain structure and you still want to be able to retain hearing in those patients that still have functional hearing. Okay, great. Yeah, I can, I can share that experience. We also published a series in children and adults which required reimplantation after a few years for various reasons. And, and uh, also in two cases, we had to in, actually insert a longer electrode and uh, it, it, it is possible because you can make use of the fiber sheet you have of the prior electrode. You can use that as a guide, guiding tunnel. Uh, we found frequently that use that fiber sheet for, and just introduce the new electrode 
into that. And we were able to implant the longer electrode in, in a, and didn't really encounter any resistance in, 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 in those scenarios, yeah. Right, thank you very much. So Professor Rajan, may I just forward the next question to you from Eva. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there any difference in the type and concentration of the steroids used during the insertion? Um, that's a very interesting question. There's a lot of debate about that. We know certain steroid types penetrate the Iran window membrane better than others, um, but Basically, you know, there's no, there's unfortunately, there's no guidelines with to, we, we are sort of relying on the, you know, the treatments of uh, topical treatments of sensor, sun sensor in your hearing loss. There's some indicators about that. Uh, what we certainly know is that uh, we try to combine the use of the steroids topically to, to reach the first one, one and a half turns of the cochlea through the topical application and use the systemic steroids to cover the apex, the distal end, because there the blood labyrinth barrier is leaky, so the steroids get there. So that's the idea of combining the topical with the systemic steroids. So the exact dosage, uh, well, that's, there's a lot of research showing that obviously the topical is more effective in achieving a high dose in the purlin. Okay. Yeah, I'd concur with Ganesh just to put some actual numbers to it. Um, you know, at our institution, we're limited with, you know, the strength of steroid that, you know, we can get commercially because our pharmacy is not enthusiastic about formulating it for us. Um, so we typically do um, 10 to 12 milligrams intravenously of uh, steroids, and then I'll use a solution of 10 milligrams per mil dexamethasone and apply it in a similar way to what Ganesh mentioned. And then as far as home steroids, um, I typically just do a Medrol dose pack. I know there are people who prefer doing a higher dose steroid like uh, prednisone at 60 for a week and then tapering. And I think it's, you know, whatever people are comfortable with, but I always do the combination of the three um, where you have systemic steroids at the time of surgery, topical steroids, being applied to both the electrode as well as to the round window and then um, uh, systemic steroids orally uh, after the surgery is performed. Great, thank you very much. So our next question is about the underwater insertion, about the underwater technique. So do you have a good view and control during the insertion? So, and if not, how are you able to overcome that barrier or, or, or hurdle? Very good question. Yeah, you usually have because you know there's the magnification effect uh, underwater, but obviously the angle tilts because of the physics. You know the, and you have to get used to that. Um, but you, it, it is doable, especially if you do a large opening. Yeah, I think it's it needs some getting used to, but it's very well doable. Um, uh, certainly, don't use some crystalloid steroids. Uh, because then, you know, obviously, you're, you're sort of, uh, it's like uh, putting, uh, putting the electrode through, through fog, through mist, so that, so just use topical clear dexamethasone, and then it's, it's very well doable. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So are there any other questions? So if you want to, you can also just raise your hand and uh, turn on your microphone and ask directly or just type in, into the chat. If there are no more questions, I'll just give you a couple of more minutes, don't worry. Uh, then may I just uh, in the meantime, bring up a very basic surgical questions, maybe to you, Professor Brown, you nicely elaborated on how to optimize the view, especially as far as the course of the facial nerve is concerned. So you mentioned that you um, aggressively uh, drill down uh, the posterior wall, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you see an increased risk that if then the excess loop is coiled in the mastoid well, that it's due to the spring force and the applied pressure to that small bony bridge, so to say, that mm, the, the electrode lead or the excess loop may extrude in the uh, exterior canal then? 
Yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question, and um, that is a concern. And certainly, we've had a couple circumstances where there have been electrode extrusions, and we've had to go back in and reinsert them. Um, one of the modifications of the technique, um, after seeing this happen a few times, that I have done to help prevent that is that um, in the facial recess, and I do this even, you know, obviously for hearing preservation cases as well and there have been no issues is I'll take a small piece of muscle and actually use that to help wedge the electrode within the facial recess. Um, and that I think takes out some of the mobility that Ganesh was talking about as you're um, sort of winding the electrode lead within the mastoid cavity and also provides the additional benefit of resisting that uh, pulling force that can sometimes happen if the uh, electrode lead after you've closed um, sort of uh, unwinds itself in an unfavorable way. Okay, All right. Thank you very much. So I think we are nearly at the end of our time. There's just a last question popping up in the chat. So how important to you is having the right surgical tools at your job? And how could you please tell us what you both preferably use and why? Well. Could be a long answer probably but maybe just in a few words mm -hmm. well i can start with that um i use a very simple i do manual insertions and all i use is this old you know push you know the old uh, fork which metal produced so a similar cochlear is a similar one which is quite nice which i just use i don't use uh, any forceps or anything um what i use is Actually, uh, the, the, the lower edge of the, the facial recess is for me like a recess to lay the electrode down, just like and guide, guide that, give it the right trajectory. So, you, and that's what Kevin alluded to earlier. It's making use of the facial recess nicely also in that way with regard to the, the insertion uh, trajectory. Yeah, I would, I would have agree with that, um, you know, globally speaking, as far as equipment, um, I use a Zeiss Pentero or Pentero 800, depending on which operating room I'm in. I use a, a striker drill with their array of um, bit choices and everything. And then for the actual insertion of the implant, um, I actually use the Medel forceps. Um, I prefer the ones that when you squeeze them, um, they actually separate. And then when you release them, it holds onto the electrode. I think that helps me do a bit of a softer insertion um, because um, if you push too hard with it, it'll actually release from the, uh, from the forceps. Um, and then similar to what Ganesh said, I'll use the, the facial ridge as a pivot point for the electrode. And when you do that, you can change your angle that you're inserting off of that pivot point to make your electrode go more superior, more inferior, more anterior, more posterior. And I think it creates a lot of, a lot more flexibility as far as getting the proper angle of insertion and orientation that you'd like. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much. So time flies, we are already at the end of our today's session. So um, I would like again to thank our speakers to share their knowledge and experience with us. So, but before we close, I just would like to use the opportunity to announce our next experts online event on September 7th. So where Dr. Daisy Tavora will give us her insights, her expert view about the cortical zone. So using cortical auditory responses in daily clinical practice. So um, please keep in mind <clears throat> that uh, these sessions and all the previous sessions uh, are recorded and you can watch them at the Medal Academy under Medal Academy, sorry, academy.medal.com. And we are looking forward to seeing you again. Have a nice day and stay tuned. <clears throat>